Sure, I've made some improvements to the text to enhance its readability and coherency. One last thing before we get into today's episode. Um, just thought I would put this out there and let you guess. I figure most people, if you've been listening long enough, you probably know or will be able to figure it out. But one of these five stories is my true scary story from, uh, yeah, a while ago. Have fun figuring out which one you think it is. Guess in the comments below. All right, I'll leave you alone. Let's get into the stories. I work deliveries in a really ritzy neighborhood in the Valley of California. The properties are stretched out along steep canyons and cliffs, so the roads are narrow, and the driveways are always straight up and down. I was relatively new to the job, and really enjoyed the different aspects of it. Driving all day on the clock, seeing beautiful places, unique houses, and the different people were all kind of a bonus for me. The story takes place before COVID, so delivery work was a little friendlier and not so scrutinized. One day, I had a particularly large shipment to disperse. And because of the layout of the neighborhood, I was just getting it done at a snail's pace, maybe even slower. I got a few packages jumbled up, found myself turning around more than once, the addresses on some of the homes were obscured by all kinds of nonsense. So locating some of the places was next to impossible. I didn't have a Tom Tom or Garmin to help me out. This was quite a while ago. I pride myself on being a low stress person. So I just took the one day, one mile, one package at a time. I did my best to lose myself in the scene, views, and radio hits, which honestly isn't hard to do out here. As the day wore on, I found myself with a rapidly dwindling load of mail, but the sun dipped and I realized I was now working overtime. We usually had to check this out with a supervisor, but I'd already gone over an hour at this point and I only had a few parcels left. So I just ran with it and decided to finish up because I was late. I started driving a little quicker and going right up to the houses instead of the end of the driveway. The less walking I did, the better, especially with the long roadways. I get the address off the next drop and start driving out into a darker area of the neighborhood. There's only a couple of houses out here, and even then, only one or two of them actually have lights on. These homes are the biggest out here. I've seen multi-million dollar homes with all kinds of crazy outdoor wreck. I pass a gate, take a turn, and find myself driving up a very long, lonely driveway up a hillside. Once I get to the top, the house is absolutely stunning. There's a multi-car garage and what looks like a guest house above that then a terrace that connects it to the house, and then this utterly Romanesque house that towers above the cliffside. My first initial thought is, what the hell could this person have ordered that they don't actually already have? The package is mid-sized and kind of heavy, but I'm not nosy, so I don't shake it or anything. I walk it up to the door because it's late, and the house is so out of the way. I don't bother ringing the doorbell. With my luck, it'll be a celebrity I like, and I'll have to disturb their private dinner party or something. As I turn and start heading back toward the van, one of the garage doors opens beside me. Lights spill out and illuminate the driveway. I turn to see a pair of headlights coming up the pass slow to a stop when they see me, and then park jackknifed in front of the exit. I thought it was kind of weird, but then it occurred to me they might have security up here. I did pass through a gate, so maybe someone is coming to see what I was doing here, especially so late at night. I had the… certainly, 
Here is the continuation of the text, with improved structure and clarity. Package already delivered, so I figured everything would be very easy to explain. The door opens, and out comes this tall, decently built guy. He's not threatening or anything. Just has his hands in his pockets as he checks out my work van. When he sees the very recognizable logo, he nods and seems relieved. I say hello and explain that I've been behind all day. He says it's all fine. He didn't know who I was and then explained that he was having issues with trespassers on the property, especially over the last few months. I say how crazy that seems to me, considering how far out of the city we are, how isolated the cliff sides are. He smiles and says, yeah, and it is crazy, but so are the people who keep showing up. I laugh, but he doesn't react. After that, he just stares at me with this weird glare, as if I'm one of those people sneaking around his property. Awkwardly, I tell him to have a good night and then start to walk back toward the van. He stops me and says, don't I have to sign for that? I shake my head and say no, not necessarily. He insists, certain that I'm making some kind of mistake. He keeps staring me down with those dark, dead eyes. For as well put together as this guy is, his demeanor is legitimately scary, like crazy scary. I look over the spotless, blacked-out SUV that he just drove up the hill, and then it hits me. He's got to be on some kind of drugs. I ask him if he can move his car, to which he corrects me, saying it's more like a truck with 4x4 and a lift, all kinds of aftermarket additions. He then asks me if I want to see them, to which I decline. Now I'm getting seriously weirded out. Every time he speaks, he takes these little, almost unnoticeable steps towards me. And before long, he's only a couple of feet from me. He looks over my van and asks about the specs of it. I work for the delivery company. I don't know anything about the van. He nods and then does a lap around it, then starts telling me what he thinks about it. He compliments the suspension and criticizes the paint, but says he understands it's a car. In the clock, speaking of a clock, I really need to get out of here. I ask him if he can move his truck again. He nods, but then holds out his hand. He asks if I have that paperwork for him to sign. Oh my God, you have to be kidding me. This guy was like coked out obsessed with the notion of having some kind of receipt. I went to the van, wrote a slip for the package out of sheer desire just to get out of here. The whole time I'm writing, he's still circling the van, telling me all kinds of weird stuff about it, like the preferred gasoline and how easy it'd be to cut the brake lines. Now I'm starting to sweat. I can see through the veneer of his wealth and what I see is a total creep. Bad teeth, bad skin, eyes so dark that they're sunken, and they totally blend in with the dark night sky behind him. I signed the sticker and then handed it over to him. He looked it up and down and nodded, but didn't sign it. He asked me if I knew why he wanted that, and I told him no. He looked me in the eyes and said, just in case anything bad happens to you. I can tell them that it didn't happen here. It's got the time you left and everything. He points to the camera on the corner of the garage, but doesn't turn to look at it, just makes the gesture. He said his signature lined up at the time on the security system of when I left. I smiled and said thank you so much for your concern. I appreciate all the extra measures. He laughs and said it was for him, not me. So now if I drove away and got raped and murdered and thrown off the cliffside, he wouldn't be involved in the investigation. It was like his alibi. These are his words. 
He's now closing the last few steps between us. I backed into the driver's seat of the van, but he was so close, I couldn't even close the door. I started to panic, and the emotions rolled across my face. He stops, laughs, then pats me on the shoulder. Don't be so anxious, he said. A job isn't worth getting stressed over. He backed up and then closed the door for me, tapped on the glass and waved. I slammed the key into the ignition, secured everything in the van while he moved his car and then parked it in the garage. I remember turning around and casting one more look at this guy. He was just standing there in the light of his garage door, hand still in his pocket. When he saw I was looking, he pointed up to the camera, then tapped his watch. I've never driven faster in my life. No idea if this guy was coked up, a psycho, or just messing with the delivery girl. But from there on out, I was not as friendly with people that I delivered to. This actually happened two weeks ago. I don't think anything will ever top this experience for me. I had gotten a new delivery location as we totally rotated regions within the station and other DSPs. I got sent into town an hour and a half away from the station with only around 90 stops. This was known as a cakewalk delivery region, so I was actually kind of looking forward to it. Everything went well. I finished in the town deliveries, and so far, everyone I encountered seemed to be incredibly kind. This was until my last 10 or maybe 20 stops, which were rural, and then outside of that town. When I mentioned this to my last delivery, he wrinkled his nose and told me to be careful. Some of the locals were nothing but trouble. I was a little excited at this prospect. What kind of weird activity would I get a front row seat to? The stuff in my head was way funnier than what I actually encountered. People were well beyond poor, but actually cratered into poverty. Some of the kids watched me drive by. It seemed like they'd never seen a delivery van before. I got to an address way out in the boonies. As soon as I entered their driveway, it was filled with random garbage everywhere. Microwaves, chairs, washers, dryers, wheels, everything you'd think you'd find in a dump. I was certain that I was going to end up popping a tire driving through all of this stuff. I drove all the way into the driveway to find that there was no house, just a small place to turn around in. I ended up turning around, confused where this house could be. As I was driving out the way I came, I slowly looked around to find anywhere just to leave this package. I spotted this small shack, probably half the size of my van. I was just going to, to go tuck it in the inlet so it wouldn't get wet if it rained. I didn't expect anyone to actually be inside this desolate little shack, but as soon as I got close and set the package down, a dude who looked like he hadn't showered in months or even changed clothes came out with a hunting knife and a gun tucked inside his belt. That startled me, so I started stepping back a bit, thinking of ways to retreat to my van without getting stabbed or shot. My van was a good distance away since I parked it on firm ground, and that shack was on marshy grass. I also thought running would definitely escalate the situation since the guy came out asking me who I was and why I was on his property. I explained that I was with Amazon and I had a package. He shouted back that all of that was impossible. He didn't have Wi-Fi, a computer, or even a cell phone. He didn't get packages out here. I replied that maybe a family member or a friend could have sent him a package, but if he didn't want it, I could take it back. He went on to say all of his family is dead, then asked if I wanted to know how they died. I replied back with no, 
I'm okay. And that I was just going to leave the package. This upset him more. He then told me that people who drive unmarked vans out here get shot. At this point, I'm thinking this dude is going to take his gun out. So I asked him if he knew why we had to use white vans instead of our Amazon branded vans, which surprisingly seemed to de-escalate the situation. I explained that some of the white vans have four wheel drive for the hills and the dirt and gravel roads up here and Amazon branded ones don't. I'm honestly just trying to talk my way out or de-escalate it, whatever I have to do at this point. Then the guy told me to wait. He has a surprise. He goes back inside his shack again. I'm thinking I need to fast walk to my van, but he comes out and tells me he needs his box. He wanted to trade me something for it. I declined and told him I would just leave it on the ground for him to take. I didn't need anything. I said it was really time for me to get going because I had a million other deliveries. For whatever reason, logic then seemed to speak to this guy. He goes on to produce this huge Ziploc bag of what looks like meth crystals and weed, all shaken and smashed together. He told me I can have it. I don't know how. I just noticed this now. But when I looked to the guy's right, I noticed something hanging up from the wall. I couldn't believe my eyes at first, but sure enough, it was a dead dog strapped to the overhang. It was mangled and decaying. It had clearly been up there for a while. It was beyond horrific and really put the situation in perspective for me. I look back at the guy who's shaking this big bag of meth and weed. I told him I'm good, man. I'm on the job right now. He then pointed his knife at me and started to approach. And then at that point, I just turned around and started walking back toward the van. He said he just wanted me to take his knife and open the box since he thought it was an Amazon package. And he was sure the box would explode if he opened it. So he wanted me to do it instead. I sliced it open in two seconds, then sprinted back to my van. I had actually made it out of there without getting knifed or shot. Although, I might have contracted something from touching that knife. I drove up the road a bit until I was a good distance from that hut, then had a total mental breakdown. It was just some of the craziest stuff of my career. I let the anxiety wash over me as I replayed what the hell just took place. I made a statement with my dispatch and they sent an OTR. But apparently, Amazon didn't deem what happened bad enough to blacklist the address unless I made a case number with the police. I didn't want to get that involved, so I just let it go. Once I transferred to a new region, we all just watch for that lot number now expecting someone else to have to go pay him another visit. This took place in 2016. I work for the USPS delivering mail in the Midwest. I've been at this job for around five years, and I can honestly say I've met and encountered some very unique individuals, to say the least. I'll give you a quick description of myself because I feel it's relevant to the story and how I don't look exactly like your typical mailman. I'm a male, around six feet, 195 pounds, covered in tattoos, with long blonde hair and gauges. Although many people have told me I don't look approachable, I am friendly. I'm kind to everyone I encounter, especially while working. Now, back to the actual event itself. I'd recently started a new route and since I was so low on the totem pole seniority-wise, this route wasn't exactly in the nicest neighborhoods. Towards the end of the day, I would finish my route down this long stretch of road with a lot of decrepit houses that were either vacant or barely livable, at least in my opinion. With only a few deliveries remaining, my last package for the day 
was for Mr. Smith and what looked like medication from the VA hospital. Myself being a fellow vet, I thought, well, at least I know me and him will get along nicely. Mr. Smith's trailer was located down a small, narrow dirt path that also had three or four other trailers around it. As I said earlier, this was my first day on this route, so finding the actual trailer was belonging to him was going to take a moment or two. Seeing that they weren't labeled with actual numbers, most of the other trailers around had garbage and random objects lying around as well as windows being smashed and graffiti on them. So I assumed those weren't the ones that were occupied. There was only one that stuck out and looked halfway livable. So I guessed and assumed this was the one. I jumped out of my truck and headed up the stairs, then gently knocked on the door. I heard footsteps approach the door right before it yanked open, revealing a very large man easily 6'6 six, six, or 6'7, six, pushing 300 plus pounds. He belted out this booming, yeah. I quickly stammered out, hey sir, I have a package that needs a signature for Mr. Smith. He replied with, oh yeah, that's my father, but I can sign for it for him, no problem. It's a frequent thing for family to sign for other family so I handed him the slip of paper. He fumbled with it, trying to find a surface to write on. And it was then I immediately smelled all the booze. I quickly realized that this dude was hammered. It took him way longer than it should have to scribble a name down onto that slip. He finally handed it back to me and I handed him the small parcel. I gave him a, all right, have a good evening, man. As I was about to leap off the porch, head back to the office and call it a day and have a few drinks myself. It's been a long week. Just as I was getting off the porch, he yelled out at me, hey, uh, is that Michael the Archangel and Lucifer tattooed on your arm? I turned around and replied, yeah, it is, politely chuckling. He then told me he's got a painting in the garage of them and it looks exactly like that tattoo. I'm thinking to myself in the moment, all right, cool man, that's random as hell. But out loud, I spoke, wow, that's crazy man, cool. I turned around, walking back to my truck again. But as I did so, he yelled out to me once more, you want to see it? Internally to myself, I thought, not really, I really don't care. But I mumbled out to him, sorry man, I need to get back to the office, unfortunately. But before I actually got back in the truck to leave, he darted over to the garage and then insisted I come in, saying it will only take a second. Without actually saying it, he held out his arm and gave that after you motioned to an open garage door. Before I even realized what I was doing, I found myself stepping inside, cursing myself for being a people pleaser and having a hard time saying no or being rude to people. Although it was 5 p.m. in the middle of summer and the sun still out, shining brightly, the garage itself was pitch black. I noticed the two small windows were covered with newspapers and an initially weird sketchy situation was now getting even sketchier. He closed the door and I was immediately plunged into complete darkness. I then muttered aloud, uh, it's kind of dark in here. He followed back, chuckling. Yeah, give me a sec. I'll, uh, I'll get the light. A few moments passed and I heard a soft click as he pulled the string on this tiny light bulb, which barely illuminated anything. It was enough to notice, though, that the floor was completely covered in empty liquor 
and beer bottles, trash, and of course, rusty tools were all strewn about. He moved past me and walked to what appeared to be the back room of the garage, then just stood at the threshold. It's back here. I continued with my mail delivery, driving through the rural neighborhoods on my route. These areas were often considered rural, where most people received their mail in large communal mailboxes with slots for each address. I preferred starting with these deliveries to keep the loose mail organized in my car. As I was filling up one of these mailboxes, a car drove by, and I turned to wave with a big, toothy smile, something many of the locals had come to expect from me. However, I didn't recognize this car. It had the kind of aesthetic you'd see in a more upscale neighborhood where the wealthier residents lived. The windows were heavily tinted and the rims were shiny. It wasn't just a cool car. It had a certain pimped out quality to it that was quite uncommon in the area. This was a big deal for my 16 year old self to acknowledge back then, especially in Florida that a young white kid in a pimped out car was the pinnacle of cool for me. The car drifted by and gave me a weird feeling. It was definitely out of place in these rural surroundings and with its tinted windows, it added an air of unfriendliness. I didn't really know what to think. Maybe it was an undercover cop. A few of my friends in school had dads who were cops and some of them told stories about detectives who got to drive cool cars and carry better guns. At least, that's what we always heard. I kept an eye on it as it rolled down the road, being careful not to turn and fully look through. I just didn't want any trouble. Like I said, this was Florida, and things were absolutely crazy back then, just like they are now. But I had my dad in my ear, telling me just how crazy things could get. My brain was already racing with notions of hitmen, human trafficking, and God knows what else. I just did my best to focus on the mail so I could finish and move on. I felt very vulnerable with my back to the street like that. The car was probably nothing, and by now, they were almost out of sight. But just then, the car stopped. It lurched with the transmission and slowly rolled backward into a driveway before turning around. The car was coming right back at me and I only had a few letters left. I had taken a few karate classes back then, so I knew some breathing techniques that could help me focus. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't planting my feet, just in case I needed to throw a tremendous spinning back kick. It rolled up on me and just kept going. It was an older couple from what I could see, wearing their Sunday best and completely lost. They waved and drove back the way they came. I finished up the mailboxes with little incident. For whatever reason, the slowness of that dark sedan triggered my fight or flight response and just put me on edge for the rest of the afternoon. This experience actually became a habit for me for the rest of my life. After living in Florida, personal security is a huge priority for me. After I finished the mail at the mailboxes, there was one job left, which was to go to the door with the bigger parcels. Fortunately, there were only a few of them that day. My system was very simple. I would go to the furthest address first then slowly start working my way back until everything was delivered. That way, when the last drop-off was done, I was relatively close to the country roads that would take me back to town. The first address was a shoebox-sized package, nothing heavy, but the address was in one of the neighborhoods my dad had warned me about many, many times. I wasn't nervous, but I was on high alert after my encounter with that weird car. I just wanted to be done with the workday. When I got to the first house, it was pretty deep in the thicket of trees and brush, shrouding my view of it. 
the entire property was lined with a tall fence, and the gate was secured with a no trespassing sign. I shrugged and started to turn the car around when I saw a second sign dangling by some tape from the first. The message was simple, exactly what I didn't want to see. Mailman, okay. I parked the cutlass on the side of the street, grabbed the package, and one other thing before getting out of the car. A canister of pepper spray that my dad had bought me when I started the job. He insisted that I keep it in the car or in my pocket, just in case anything ever happened. He explained. I slipped the pepper spray back into my pocket, making sure it was properly aimed this time, and decided to head back to my car. The driveway was long, and the house was quite a distance away, but I had to be cautious. As I approached the gate, I noticed the latch was a simple single latch system. I considered leaving it open just in case things got weird, but I decided it wasn't worth the trouble. With my karate skills, youth, and pocket full of mace, I fancied myself pretty unstoppable. I casually walked down the driveway until I spotted the house. It was a ramshackle dump that screamed of criminal activity. There were half-stripped cars in the front yard and a cracked front window. It could have been just poverty, but it felt like something more to me. I knocked on the door but received no response, so I elected to simply leave the package by the door. The house was private enough that there was no chance of theft. As I turned back to the yard to head for the car, I caught some movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to find a big, ugly dog staring me down. It had come out from under one of the cars, and it looked starving and extremely pissed. This didn't deter me at first. I'm a dog guy, always have been. So I tried to relax and reached one hand out as a peace offering. The dog didn't like that. It charged me, all teeth and eyes, literally frothing at the mouth. Mailman, okay? That was a sick joke. Did I just get lured into some hillbilly's idea of a practical joke? As it barreled toward me, I realized my miscalculation. I wasn't indestructible, and this dog was way bigger than I first thought. It had already made a move, which left me with only one option. I pulled the pepper spray out of my pocket, turned the nozzle to the business mode, and aimed it right at the dog. The problem with this was that it didn't give a damn. It had no idea what I was holding, and my brandishing it had no effect whatsoever. I hit the button and watched as a big, misty cloud filled the air, but not in the right direction. In my panic to get the mace out of my pocket, I mistakenly turned the nozzle so that it was aiming right between myself and the dog. We both watched as we both reacted to the chemicals retreating, and then respectively starting to freak out. For 15 minutes, me and that dog were rolling around in the dirt, howling for help. No one was home, so no one came. After a while, we started to recover, but only in the sense that we weren't crying and screaming anymore. Neither of us could see or smell, which turned out to be an advantage. I knew this dog was going to be royally pissed off now and would still have an interest in tearing me apart. If it got a hold of me, it would be over. I rolled to my right to create some distance between us, and I remembered that it was pretty much just an open yard over there, nothing to get hung up in. Once I felt the dirt change to grass beneath me, I stopped and got to my knees. My vision was shot but I could see outlines, some shapes, and colors. I could see the striped car in front of me, the dog to the left of it, and the house not too far away. For almost the next 30 minutes, I tiptoed across the yard, desperately trying not to get the attention of this dog. I couldn't run because if I tripped and it hurt me, 
it would probably be able to, to get to the apartment. I make my way towards the entrance, and there's graffiti all over the place. I'm starting to think I should have called it a day, but I'm already here. The address on the package matches the apartment number. I press the buzzer, and there's no response. I try a couple more times, but still nothing. I knock on the door, but it feels like I'm knocking on solid steel. I'm about to give up and head back to the truck when I hear someone shuffling inside. The door creaks open slowly, and there stands a tall, lanky guy with wild, unkempt hair and a scruffy beard. He gives me a wary look and asks, you the delivery guy? I nod and hold up the package. Yeah, I've got a delivery for you. He takes the package from my hand and looks at it as if he's trying to remember if he ordered something. Thanks, man. Sorry about the delay. It's been crazy around here lately. I nod again, feeling uneasy about the whole situation. This place doesn't exactly scream safe neighborhood. I decide to make a quick exit. As I turn to leave, I hear the guy mutter something under his breath. It sounds like he's talking to himself, but I can't quite make out what he's saying. I don't want to stick around to find out, so I start walking back towards my truck. Just as I reach the edge of the parking lot, I hear a loud bang. I freeze in my tracks and look back towards the apartment. The guy is standing in the doorway, holding a gun. He's aiming it right at me. Hey, he yells. You didn't see anything, okay? I nod frantically, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't see anything, man. I'm just a delivery guy. He keeps the gun trained on me as I slowly make my way back to the truck. I can feel his eyes on me the entire time. Once I'm inside the safety of the truck, I speed away from that apartment complex as fast as I can. I didn't report the incident to my company or the police. I just wanted to put it behind me and forget about it, but it haunted me for weeks afterward. That encounter made me realize that being an essential worker in a tough neighborhood during a pandemic was not as glamorous as it might have seemed. It was a stark reminder of the dangers that can come with the job. Even when all you're trying to do is deliver a small package. In the apartment adds, we don't want any trouble, man. Just come inside and we'll sort this out. I'm feeling a rush of panic and trying to keep a level head. I know I can't go inside with them. If I do, who knows what might happen? So I take a deep breath and try to sound as calm as possible. Look guys, I didn't throw your package or anything like that. I just left it at the door like I'm supposed to. If it's damaged, I'm really sorry, but I can't come inside with you. Company policy, you know? Cigarette guy starts getting agitated and steps closer, while the guy in the apartment keeps the gun pointed at me. You think you can just mess with people's stuff and get away with it? We know you're lying. I'm feeling trapped, and it seems like things could escalate quickly. I decide to take a risk and pull out my phone, pretending to make a call to my dispatcher. Okay, okay. Let me just call my boss and see what we can do to sort this out. I'll get this sorted for you. I start pretending to talk on the phone with a concerned tone. Hey boss, I've got a situation here. Yeah, I left a package at this address and they're saying it's damaged, but I swear I didn't do anything. Yeah, they've got a gun and I'm feeling really uncomfortable. I keep pretending to talk to my dispatcher describing the situation in detail, hoping that these guys will back off, thinking that help is on the way. Meanwhile, I'm ready to hit the emergency button on my phone to call 911 if things take a turn for the worse. The guy in the apartment looks at me with uncertainty, and cigarette guy seems to be getting nervous. After a tense moment, 
they exchange glances, and the guy with the gun slowly lowers it. Fine, just sort it out, but don't think you can mess with people's stuff like that. I nod vigorously, still pretending to talk to my boss. Thanks, boss. I'll make sure everything's sorted out. Sorry for the inconvenience. I then turn and quickly walk away from the apartment, never looking back until I'm safely back at my delivery truck. Once inside, I lock the doors and call 911 to report the incident. The police arrive shortly after, and I give them a detailed description of the guys and the situation. It was a terrifying experience, and it taught me to always trust my instincts and follow company safety protocols when dealing with potentially dangerous situations during my deliveries, turning the drawers in the kitchen upside down, searching for a flashlight, while the other guy was just yelling, keeping an eye on the dark hall in front of him. They didn't find a flashlight, but they were both holding cell phones, and this seemed to be my chance. So I told them that both of their phones had flashlights, they just had to turn them on. They both went mental at this realization and frantically flicked their lights on. They instructed me to keep an eye on the front door and watch their backs. I nodded like we were old war buddies and I'd never let them down. As they went down the hallway and checked the rooms, I slowly shuffled back to the door and unlatched the deadbolt. The last thing I saw was the glare of the cell phone lights against the dingy back wall and the shaky silhouettes of the pistols going from one room to the other. Absolute chaos. I wasn't out of the woods yet though. I still needed to get back to my truck in the sketchy complex and then navigate my way out of the slums and back into the city. It was much later than I thought and all I wanted to do was just get home I went from a walk to a light jog to not draw too much attention. Everything was going smoothly until I reached the parking lot when I heard something behind me. I still don't know exactly what I heard, but it sounded like someone running up on me. So I whirled around and there was no one there. All right, now I'm hearing things. As I turned to face back into the parking lot, I rotated just in time and stepped into the angled antenna of one of the cars nearest to me. It had been bent at the base, so it just jutted out instead of going straight up and down. That antenna was also perfectly level with my eye, and it pushed right beneath the lid and then right behind my actual eye. I harpooned my own face in a mad dash to get the hell out of this place. There was no grace in that reaction and in panic, I flailed backward to get away from whatever was causing the pain, only to injure myself worse. That antenna had a little bead on the end, which I could feel putting pressure between my eye. That metal rod must have been inside my eye at least an inch or two. When I pulled myself backward, all of it slid out the same way it went in, and the pain was beyond all measure. Droplets of blood were now leaking from the base of my eye. I was stuck within 15 feet of the security of my delivery truck, but I couldn't see the keys to open up the door. I stumbled to the back and sat on the bumper, just holding my eye and praying that it didn't fall out. After around 45 minutes, my vision cleared up a little, but the pain was still explosive. I managed to get back into the truck and then slowly drive back toward my house. As we didn't have to return them if we were behind, we just swapped it out for a totally new, fully loaded truck in the morning. My eye thankfully didn't fall out, but I did require some pretty involved visits to the doctor for around 18 months after that. I like to think that those crackheads are still holed up in that apartment, looking for a phantom burglar, they probably don't even remember taking me hostage. Hey everyone, 
Thanks for listening if you stuck around at this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All these links are below. I hope you enjoyed this episode, guys. Kudos to you who figured it out, or whether you did or you didn't. I will confirm or deny in the comment section below. My goal for this week is to do three episodes, since I only technically did one last week outside of the stories for sleep. So today's delivery, tomorrow Wednesday, will be retail. And then after that, I think dark web. So yeah, again, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you had a good time with it. I've lost my train of thought. The weather is crappy here. It's like ice ice baby everywhere on the road. So can't really do anything. So I'm going to start on the next episode to make sure that I get three out this week. With that being said, enjoy your day, enjoy your week, enjoy it all. Live, love, laugh, eat, drink, be merry. I'm rambling, don't know what else to say. So yeah, I'll see you in the next one, guys. Cheers. In conclusion, thank you for joining me in this thrilling tale. I hope you found it as captivating as I did. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to stay updated on future episodes. If you have a spine-tingling story of your own, feel free to share it via email or on my subreddit. You can also keep up with me on social media through the links below. As always, your support is greatly appreciated. Stay safe, keep your lights on, and be prepared for whatever eerie encounters may lurk in the shadows. Until next time, take care, and may your nights be free from the unknown horrors that may hide in the darkness. Cheers, and stay tuned for more spine-chilling tales. <laughs>